Um, one of the benefits of being an executive level partner of WTS is the benefit of introducing our speakers um, prior to the events. And today we have Denise Gasolino of AECOM. So Denise, um, feel free to take it from here. Okay, thanks, Kim. Um, and on behalf of AECOM, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce the commissioner. And I also wanna do a shout out to WTS and all the great work that you do um, for the Chicago area and our engineering community. So um, our, our commissioner, Gia Biaggi, she is an urban planner and designer with experience in both private and public sectors. She was appointed commissioner of the Chicago Department of Transportation, CDOT, by Mayor Lightfoot in December, 2019. The mayor charged Gia with implementing a few things, a vision for transportation, for a transportation system that prioritizes equity and mobility, and at the same time works to lower the economic and environmental burden of transportation on residents and communities. As commissioner of CDOT, she oversees the department that is responsible for our roadways, our bridges, sidewalks, bike lanes, traffic signals, signage, streetlights, and all the permit permitting activities in the public right of way. Also included is the citywide bike share system and policies focused on complete streets, climate adaption, and new mobility. Her current work includes development of the city's new strategic plan for transportation and implementation of Mayor Lightfoot's Chicago Works Capital, Capital Improvement Infrastructure Program, which I know we are all excited about. Before, um, before she said yes to Mayor Lightfoot to return to public service, um, Gia was a principal at Studio Gang Architects, one of Chicago's and the world's leading architecture and urban design firms led by renowned architect Jeannie Gang. At Studio Gang, her work centered on how to move toward equity, mutuality, and positive change in cities by working with a range of partners, including community-based organizations, cultural institutions, developers, government, and other public and private groups and individuals. Prior to joining Studio Gang, Gia spent more than a decade in public service at the Chicago Park District in roles that included Director of Planning and Development and Chief of Staff. So with that, um, Commissioner, it's all yours. All right. Well, that was plenty. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's such a treat uh, to be introduced by you, Denise. Um, you know, you uh, gave so much to making the city a better place and you keep doing it from AECOM. So thank you. Um, and it is great to see a couple of familiar faces on the line uh, for those of you who turned your cameras on, uh, like Ann Sheehan, who has been such a leader at the city as well um, and is now snapped up by HNTV. So I'm glad to be here, um, and uh, what I'll do is walk you through a little bit about, you know, about CDOT, because, you know, you have to give that preamble in case folks forget what we're responsible for, and then we'll ta start talking about some of the infrastructure improvements and, and really um, some of the, the scaffolding that we've created for both policies and implementation of capital projects through our new uh, strategic plan for transportation. So I'm going to attempt to share my screen, and let's see if that works. All right, does that work? Somebody give me a thumbs yes. up. Yes. <laughs> All right, okay, we're good. All right. <clears throat> well, thanks again um, for having me here. And uh, you know, actually, let me do a full screen if you give me a second here. Uh, All right. Well, it is what it is. Um, okay. So, uh, so just as a reminder, and uh, there are folks on this call who know probably soup to nuts what we do, but it's. You know, when you list out kind of the breadth of what we manage, it's it's pretty dramatic. Um, you know, with our 4,000 miles of streets, uh, you know, 350 miles of bikeways, which I'm excited to talk about. I just came from an announcement on the south side um, that I can get into in a second when it comes to that. Um, but we're bridges and we're viaducts and streetlights and alleys and, and all the things. And, you know, as you think about it, when you step out your front door, uh, that first couple of feet, you're immediately in the public right of way. And that's, of course, what we care so much about. Um, but it really is from, from policy to potholes, as I like to say. And there are a couple of um, key pieces of our work. And, and one is around mobility and transit, of course. And this is thinking about how we work hand in glove with whether it's the Chicago Transit Authority and making it easier for buses to move throughout the city. Um, whether it's delivering on our bike share, where we have the largest bike share program in the country by geography, uh, we're covering the most land area. And by this time next year, 
There will be bike share in every corner of the city of Chicago. Uh, we run that program um, as well, looking at you know how it is we can make it as easy as possible for folks to move around the city, whether you're on foot or that bike or on that bus or on that train, and then you can drive your car. Uh, but we definitely are really emphasizing walkability, affordability, and, and comfort right on that public way that we own together in common. Um, as you all know, right, we do a lot of planning and design and engineering, and, and really um, we learn learned so much from our collaborations um, with consultants and you help bring so much to the work that we're doing, whether it's our protected bike lanes and really thinking about the geometries of our intersections and uh, reducing um, uh, high crash corridors um, through the, how we can affect the design um, and all kinds of things like that. Um, really, and the third piece, construction and maintenance and stewardship, and I think this is a group that knows this too, um, but it's really uh, sort of nose to tail, right? So we begin by thinking about the policies, and we are actually, unlike uh, uh, maybe uh, many, many jobs on earth, you can imagine something and you can design it, but how often do you have to take it all the way through construction and then manage it, right? And so it, it helps create a lens uh, for everything that we do, um, whether it's the tree planting and you know this year a uh, CDOT alone uh, planted 2,600 trees across the city um, that's contributed to the more than uh, 4,800 that got planted this past year um, to you know the everyday maintenance that um, we we do on um, street lights and street poles and signs and all the other things. I think in the last big theme um, one that really we've been able to explore um, with, in some ways, uh, the opportunity of the streets being um, less active, at least in 2020, um, as part of a COVID response and folks staying at home or commuting in different patterns, uh, gives an opportunity really to um, it lean into our imagination, right, about what streets can do. And I think, you know, as we talk about kind of the future of cities and what role streets play in them, this kind of temporal nature that is what we're doing maybe hour by hour on a street might become more important uh, than one sort of thematic use type like this street and we just move cars and that's what we do. Um, but the notion that, for example, you know, in the photo on the left, um, that we could repurpose sections of streets for our shared streets program, also in the photo on the right, that really calm down streets and we're uh, done through neighbors raising their hand and saying this is something that we need to see happen. We'd like a little more room to move during COVID and then have asked for it to continue to come back or in the middle of the frame outdoor dining. Um, which is something we delivered with a couple of other uh, departments, including uh, the Bureau of Consumer Protection. Um, and this is really how we can be that economic support, right, for our, our restaurants and other um, folks that need to sell things in that socially distanced way, who now have come back and said, you know, COVID be damned, we want to keep doing this. Um, and so that's something, these kinds of experimentations are part of what we do, and then how that gets codified uh, toward really rethinking um, how we position our streets in service of what people need and want. That is what we're trying to do every day. Um, so, but I, I, you know, as we look at all of those great things that we're doing, uh, what's inescapable is the map. Um, and this is a map of income levels across the city. And um, if you've looked at so much of what Mayor Lightfoot and the administration is talking about, uh, whether it's ending generational poverty, whether it's addressing structural racism, um, all so much of the experience of Chicagoans is nested in policy decisions that have been made uh, decade after decade after decade that get us a map like this. And this is an income map where on the left, and, and hopefully you've seen this by now, this is from UIC and the Voorhees Center. Um, and where you're looking at, you know, in the dark red is where you have very low income and the blue is very high income. And you can see from 1970 to essentially the present day, really the spatialization of, of poverty uh, across our city is particularly on the south and west sides um, and these concentrations of wealth um, really on the north um, lake side, the northeast side of the city. So our job, right, is to change that map. And it, because these maps as they are now came out of decisions, the decisions we make going forward, um, they matter. And if you listen to the mayor's uh, budget speech yesterday, uh, really leaning into how do we center our work toward um, equitable distribution? How do we make up for past wrongs? How do we set Chicago on a path to, to a new map? Um, and that's, that's really what we're here to do. So we can do this from a transportation perspective, of course. And I, uh, you heard us, uh, in the introduction of uh, 
conversation about strategic plan for transportation. And that's what we spent our time uh, in 2020 really working on. This is the first of its kind for any DOT in the wake of the national series of emergencies. So um, whether it was COVID or the murder um, that we saw in, uh, in Minnesota and so much um, racialized violence and all of those challenges, um, what we have been able to do in that period of dramatic transformation and, and really important conversations about race and class and wealth and so many other things, um, we got to work and we said, well, how do we think about questions of justice, mobility, justice, economic, climate, those kinds of things, and how would we center our work um, on those kinds of, of issues and then have it create really what I would call, it, it's, it's like a, a choice architecture, right? The scaffolding for decision-making um, that is set up. So when we are thinking about something as specific as filling a pothole, how is that nested in a series of, of values um, that we have laid out that transform into goals, that transform into those strategies, tactics, like filling a pothole, and then the metric of whether we did it and where we did it and how fast we did it and all of those things. So this strategic plan for transportation we did in partnership uh, with folks from Bloomberg. If you've heard of Jeanette Sadek Khan, a really important woman in transportation, um, she was our our guide, and uh, so Bloomberg and her transportation team helped us do this work. Um, and so. You know, strategic plans can be a lot of navel gazing uh, where you just look internally. So we felt it was important to make sure that we were hearing from um, some of our critics and advocates for transportation issues. And so we worked with and helped pay for and stand up the transportation equity network, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But it was a way of saying, you know, we want to know uh, what we could do better. We want to hear from folks who are outside of our own organization. Uh, that includes city departments and agencies as well, but then quite a lot of work really sifting through um, what it is that we need to work on internally, what are some of our strengths and challenges, those kinds of things, but with that heightened focus on equitable outcomes. And really, I think a key to um, CDOT and to transportation policies and infrastructure investments is the operational health of our own department. And so we spent a lot of time having uh, very clear-eyed conversations about that. And I would argue that the, the budget that, uh, and stop of mind for me, because uh, we're in the throes of preparing for budget hearings, but the budget that came out um, for this, uh, that is coming out for the city, um, really reflects an investment in our department, particularly um, that we haven't seen in, in more than a decade. I mentioned that transportation equity network, and these are just a couple of the groups. It's a consortium of 30 uh, plus groups across the city that care very much both uh, some at a citywide level in terms of what we're doing around transportation and some at a hyper local neighborhood level. And I think that's really um, significant. It's important that we're able to toggle back and forth between folks who operate really at that systemic scale, that 30,000 foot level, and then folks who are operating that one foot scale, who are you know, working with folks on the block, thinking about that piece of street or sidewalk or boulevard that's right out their front door. And so this group gave us what we called equity challenges. And the whole plan itself is a call and response of sorts to say, where this group said, this is something that you really need to work on. And so we built goals and strategies to address it. So what are those key pillars of that strategic plan? Um, there are four. So the first is about access to opportunity. And I have to say, you know, there are a lot of reasons to do a strategic plan and certainly it's to get the house in order, right? And to make sure that we have the capacity to do things like implement, I don't know, federal dollars coming out of the sky um, and making those improvements in the city. But it is also about articulating what, we, what we've been doing, what we are doing and where we're headed. And in the absence of CDOT making that articulate, um, you know, folks do what, what anyone would do. When you're not hearing from someone on a topic you care about, you start to fill in the gaps. So we felt like this whole process and publishing it, the level of detail that we will was all about uh, transparency, holding our feet to the fire, having the public hold our feet to the fire, but also making sure that we're filling in the, that gap in information and making sure folks understand all the good work um, that we are working on and that we recognize what our challenges are. So access to opportunity is one of four major themes and it's really straightforward. It's about making it safer and easier to walk, uh, reducing commute times. And, you know, if you look at commute times and the influence on um, or how it 
it has a negative impact on our economy, um, on how it has everything to do with making it harder. If your commute times are long, it's harder to get to work. Uh, you're more apt to buy a car. You're more apt to be stuck in traffic and may, make it difficult to um, get home in time for your kids coming home from school and having uh, after school care, all those kinds of things. So reducing those commute times uh, really matters and making opportunities like cycling a safe and affordable option, uh, reducing congestion. Um, we've seen there are plenty of um, studies about the influence of congestion on our city. Um, and then as well, making efficient use of curb space. And this is, you know, something that we probably all noticed during COVID um, that suddenly you're seeing, you know, uh, I've got a, a FedEx truck and then there's an Uber who, who is over there. And then we've got someone delivering from Grubhub and that that space, that curb space, you know, between the actual curb and the lane of traffic is one of the most contested spaces in the city and it's public, it's public way. And so we're developing strategies to better manage that curb space. And you'll see that reflected in the work that we're doing. The second big theme is about aligning our streets with our values. And this is really getting at the heart of prioritizing equitable outcomes, not just outputs, but outcomes. We are trying to move the needle on things like generational poverty. Uh, we're trying to move the needle on climate justice. And so our role um, really as, as a convener, as um, an implementer, um, toward, for example, improving the quality of air and water, which has everything to do with freight and um, where we're seeing congestion happen um, and managing our shoreline even. Uh, and I think as the group on this call, bringing infrastructure into good repair. Um, the Chicago Works Program, which I'll talk about in a little bit, is a big part of that. It is a down payment um, on the future um, and really trying to make up uh, for the decades of investment um, that we never had enough money to make. Finally, um, you know, I mentioned freight, but also modernizing uses of funds and improving flexibility. That seems like a very nerdy, jargony kind of statement. But so much of what we do is dependent on monies we get from other entities like the federal government and IDOT and getting some flexibility in local spending, really unlocking some of the handcuffs uh, to how we spend it and what we might spend it on, let's say not just uh, roadways for cars, but also all the appurtenances that have something to do with quality of life, whether that's sidewalks and street lights and bike lanes and all of that. Uh, and so we've been working to get that flexibility. I'm even meeting with a, you know, the new secretary, uh, Secretary Buttigieg, um, who we think is very well aligned and his team is with the kinds of things um, that we care about. Um, so this next theme, Streets Free from Violence, um, is really thinking about where we are as a city, we certainly um, have experienced escalated levels of violence in neighborhoods uh, across the city. And we have at CEDA have a role to play in addressing violence that we are most close to um, in part. And that is certainly I'm um, thinking about reducing dangerous driving and elevating vision zero, which again, if you're in transportation, these are familiar probably concepts to you. Um, but in vision zero is really an international movement to reduce fatalities and serious injuries from traffic crashes to zero. And what does that mean? That means education. It also means design, the geometries that I mentioned earlier of our streets. How do we narrow those apertures to affect slower driving? What are all the tools in the toolbox we can use to get there? Um, making streets safer and more vibrant, that is part of what we can do in concert with efforts to reduce gun violence and other forms of violence in the city. So as we invest in neighborhoods and help help to make the context for economic development investments, it help to make places for people to gather, to help show that attention to the maintenance even of our different assets that run through neighborhoods. All of that has something to do with making communities safer um, and really part of a larger effort uh, that the mayor has convened with a whole of government approach uh, to reducing violence and activating neighborhoods through physical place-based investments. Um, and then ensuring that streets are responsive to community needs. That's really um, something that we heard loud and clear um, in the last couple of years, but we certainly hear it from groups who are, are more attuned to um, activism toward transportation that, you know, it's not something that uh, we're great at in terms of uh, having a longitudinal relationship with communities. We often hire many of you on the call um, to help us do community engagement and outreach. Um, and that's the kind of thing that um, is relationship based, right? And so we're, we need to build trust with communities uh, that last beyond a project. So it's not simply saying, okay, we're here for this project. Um, let everybody have a meeting and thank you very much. And here's pizza for your intellectual capital and we're done. 
Um, but we really need to have these longitudinal relationships where we're in constant conversations. And then when there is a project, we've already built um, those relationships of trust and hopefully we've demonstrated um, that we're, we make good on our words by the investments that we make uh, that follow and continue. And that, that's how we're going to really connect those dots between those hyper-local improvements that are meaningful and real and different in every neighborhood and how we systemically sort of connect the dots between all of the different programs for investment that we have. Um, and so then the last pillar, um, really important, uh, see how that works. We do work, we work all the time, um, we work hard, uh, but we need to be a great place to work. And, um, that, and this is really uh, directed mostly toward the department itself. How can we improve processes that make it easy to get the work done, get payments out to contractors um, to make sure that we can recruit and retain staff? Um, I think we're all feeling um, in the industry right now, it's a pretty tight labor market. And so, you know, we're competing uh, with you all for engineers and, and we know we do a good job of training young people who come work for us and then we, uh, we lose them to great companies like yours, uh, but they've learned how we work and uh, we then hire, hire them back through you to, uh, to help us do our work. And that is really important to us and it's a, it is a good system, but we also need to build up our own muscles internally. And then again, improving community and partner relationships are a big piece, as I explained earlier. Um, but that's also partners um, that are across sectors, right? That uh, I was just having a conversation with the folks at SRAM who make uh, bike components. And uh, we were having a conversation about, you know, having CDOT alone shout through a bullhorn that you should ride your bike to work is great and investing in infrastructure, but if we can get the private sector to invest in their employees and support um, those kinds of things, whether it's bike parking, whether it's encouraging folks to use Divi or public transit and providing discounts, that's something we can do together. And so we recognize that uh, improving those relationships uh, will make our city better together. And then this is what the book, and you can uh, probably throw a link in the chat or something, but you can find our change of plan online. And these are the benchmarks. So we are publishing, here are the strategies that fit under these goals. And here are some benchmarks, first year and third year, and then some of the key partners that help us deliver on. And so, you know, this is, as I mentioned earlier, for the public to know what we're working on, hold our feet to the fire um, and have a sense of, you know, where we're headed. You know, what, how are we connecting the dots between words like mobility, justice, and equity to something fundamental that you can measure. And so that's why we're publishing these. And as I said to, uh, I think a couple of reporters who uh, were uh, asking me about it on, on the day we announced. Uh, and I said, this is so you can come back to me in a year and say, commissioner, did you do this? Did you do this? And I'll say, well, yeah, we did this one and this one. I'll say, well, that was a little bit beyond what we could do, but either way, it's a living document. And it's again meant to fill in all the gaps and where we may not have been talking about what we're doing, but then to align it with an agenda around equity, inclusion, and justice. Okay, so that was a lot, right? That is that scaffolding. It's the why. Why are we doing what we're doing? And then how are we carrying it out and how will we measure? One of the big tools for carrying out so much of the strategic plan is the new Chicago Works program. And uh, and I, I have to say, I owe a lot to Ann Sheehan, who's on the line. I know I mentioned you earlier, but helping to tee up what is an absolutely transformational investment in Chicago neighborhoods. So um, what we identified is about a four and a half billion infrastructure need. And that's just for the critical stuff, right? That is like at your base level, the high priority things we absolutely need to do around bridges and street reconstruction. Uh, investments in lighting and even our fleet and facilities, city facilities. Um, so we identified this huge need and we were able to, through the mayor's leadership, get the um, get $3.7 billion uh, in a uh, capital improvement bond um, set aside for all of these kinds of projects. We've never really had local money like that in a single tranche. And we have the first 1.4 billion um, and we've been hustling and, and getting not only into a state of readiness, but really pushing projects out the door as fast as possible to spend down that one and a half billion uh, between this year, next year, and a little bit the following. Um, and then we'll go back to city council for the balance that takes us up to that 3.7. Um, and so this is, it's, it's an unbelievable 
um, investment in not only our neighborhoods, but also in getting CDOT positioned very well to be ready for those other funds I mentioned uh, that we expect to come from the federal government. And so one of the questions we get asked quite a bit, and we should be asked, which is, well, how do you decide, right? How do you, how, where are you going to spend the money? Um, how does this work? How, do, how do, does all of the information that we might know about our city fit into that? And so I do want to touch on project selection. Um, and there are really, uh, you know, four legs of the table on this. We certainly lean into condition assessment and analysis in a very big way. Um, whether it's our pavement condition index, which I'll describe in a second. Um, we have been working on a, a tremendous program um, to create a smarter lighting system, which I can also tell you more about. We get data from all of those things, our bridge inspections, you all know this, um, engineering surveys. So that's a really important indicator of where the need is. But we also um, are you know, have so many requests that come in, whether it's through city council and aldermen who we're in constant conversation with, um, whether it's our 311 service requests. Uh, but we also recognize that something like 311 for many communities is not a place where they want to um, tell us what they think. And so our ongoing community planning and engagement, we have tons of um, outreach going on all the time. Uh, but as we invest in a better way to make sure we're as accessible as possible to communities, we're able to scoop up um, the priorities that folks are seeing right in front of them. The third piece really is policy and coordination. Um, and so, you know, we have lots of initiatives like Vision Zero that I talked about. Um, today, we just announced our uh, Chicago Community Cycling Strategy. Um, it's a framework for how we will make investments in biking infrastructure. Um, and then we have, of course, really significant um, efforts like Invest South and West, which if, if you haven't heard about that by now, I mean, I, I, I don't know where, where you've been, we've buried yourself, but this is really about um, making sure that we're fixing that map that I showed you earlier and investing in the South and West sides. And that's really um, pushing on what are the economic development opportunities we can create. And we know, of course, infrastructure sets the context for those. Um, and then in addition to some of our collaboration with CTA and, and other opportunities. And then the fourth big piece is equitable distribution. And this is really a, a new piece in our capital program where we've developed criteria, weighted criteria that makes sure that we're living up to those goals around equitable distribution and uh, mobility justice and really making up uh, for historical um, need. And so I'm gonna walk you through a couple of components uh, in more detail, a couple of these components in more detail, um, but know that you know, the way that we are putting together the capital program um, is altogether uh, familiar and different at the same time. So um, this is an example from our pavement condition index. And I think it's just kind of fascinating. We do, we look at every street in the city every three years. Uh, we have video and we are able to actually do an apples to apples comparison of every single street and classify it from good to very poor condition. And that helps us give an indicator of where we need to spend our funds. So that's more technical data. Um, and then, whoops, uh, skipping a lead. There we go. Um, and then the other piece, another piece, this is in Paul's in the policy camp. And these are maps from our Vision Zero work. Um, and what's interesting is it's not just data, technical data. Um, this kind of insight is really the convergence of what is starting with technical data, where we, we know from crash numbers, where our high crash corridors are, then adding to that observed behavior where we go out and see what's happening on streets in terms of driving behavior, and then matching that with resident uh, observations, really that local lived experience of residents. This is from our West Side Vision Zero planning. And so the confluence of all of that, on top of, of course, where those fatalities have been taking place, that then becomes a driver. And so it's a more uh, looking at these points of convergence, not simply ending and start, starting and ending with the technical data, um, but the nuanced data. And that's, again, one of those ways you connect this sort of systemic thinking and technical information with local lived experience that happens at that, that out your front door level, that one foot doorstop, doorstop um, uh, experience. So this is one of our new maps. Uh, this is uh, our, what we call our, our MOBEC index. And this is, is a new way that we are adding weighted criteria to our project selection. And so we worked with a Center for Neighborhood Technology on this, and it's a combined expression of mobility hardship and economic hardship. 
So on the mobility hardship, and I talked a little bit about that with commute times, right? We wanna reduce those commute times. Um, we also wanna make sure we're investing in areas where we have a high percentage of folks who have a hard time moving around neighborhoods. This is also thinking about sidewalks. Awesome. And that. Somebody wants to go on mute, Steve Pazinski. Um, and so that's where we're looking at, you know, how we can create a, the best quality of life possible um, at that kind of scale of walkability. And then transportation as a percentage of income, you know, when you look at household income in this region, people are paying about 16% of their take-home income toward transportation. When you add to that stat that housing constitutes about 30% of that, which we know is already too high, out of pocket residents are paying almost 40% of their income toward just two things, right? And that doesn't leave much behind for the other necessities. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're making it as affordable as possible. And so that's, those are those co-investments with CTA and others that's thinking about um, making it cheaper and easier for folks to move around through the investments we're making in our mobility infrastructure. So the second piece, right, is economic hardship. Um, and this is what you think it is. It's also um, something, uh, data that's been used and tracks um, very directly uh, with race uh, that includes looking at uh, percentage of households below poverty levels, that includes um, looking at employment rates. And you can see in dark red, the combined mobility and economic hardship um, indices are really focused um, so mostly on uh, the west and south sides in this continuum. So the dark red is where you have the most mobility and economic hardship, and we call it MOBEC for short. Um, and then the lighter, I guess that's uh, salmon colored, uh, as it gets lighter, um, you're seeing a reduced amount of hardship. And so we're really focused on those areas in the red. And outlined in blue, you can see invest south and west areas. And so it's all tracking very well. Um, and then, then, as I mentioned, in addition to say invest south and west being a important criterion for us to consider as we select infrastructure projects, the mobility and economic hardship index has weighted criteria in every single program. And when I say program, I mean the more than dozen uh, different um, types of capital projects. So that's bridges, lighting, sidewalks, you know, you name it. Each one of those categories with all of those other criteria, and it, there's always a, a MOBEC score. And that makes sure that we're getting to the geographies in the city that need us the most. So how does that turn into projects? And um, I'm, I'm heading toward the finish line here and I'll be happy to take questions and get into a discussion. So uh, for example, you know, we just announced uh, 100 miles of paving, uh, resurfacing streets uh, last week out on the south side. And so much of this work is happening, uh, whether it's in-house work that we do or whether it's through contract, um, you'll see more miles of paving than we've experienced in years. And this is, again, getting to places that uh, you might see a preponderance of potholes year after year. Well, we're just redoing the street. Um, we also, I mentioned our street light program. So uh, our smart lighting program uh, is done. We have placed sensors and created technological upgrades to 280,000 uh, lights across the city. That's out of our 330,000. Uh, so now we have a connected network of lighting. This means that we'll know a light is out uh, before you do, before you have to call it in to 311. And actually, the system will actually send us the information. It will generate a work order. It will not only generate that work order, it will also route the crews uh, using um, using artificial intelligence uh, to make sure that all of the work that ought to be done is routed in the, in the proper uh, direction uh, so we can make sure that we're being as efficient as possible. It will also test the network so you don't have to, one light's out and then you got to drive around and see if a couple other lights are out. Instead, it will be able to test it and sends us the information, translates to that work order, and those work orders can be closed out in the field. So this is a huge leap forward for our city. Um, so 280,000 lights are now connected um, and we'll be doing the balance that we have left to do is mostly historic poles um, that are much more difficult, uh, as well as, as viaduct lighting that we'll be working on um, through next year. So this is a massive investment um, in our city's infrastructure, thanks to um, the smart lighting program that we started a couple of years ago with the Chicago Works Funds helping put us over the top. Um, this is an example of bike infrastructure that we're putting in. So today, um, what I was able to announce was not only that community cycling strategy, but that 
in the shortest time period ever, we've made the biggest investment in bike lanes. So in a two year period, um, we put in over 100, uh, 100 miles of bike lanes. Um, we'll be hitting 130 miles total between last year and next. So that is a huge improvement in a very short period. Um, and this is really about both the engineered, the harder infrastructure, but also bike lanes, the plastic delineators, um, and really making it easy as possible to move around the city. And this is work done. Uh, again, we have tons of in-house crews that are doing this work. Our pedestrian safety improvements um, are a big part of what we're doing. And, and that really uh, is a construct of both the pedestrian bump outs, creating signage and refuge islands and all of that kind of work that helps us live or helps us meet that test of vision zero and how can we get there. And so we've been doing improvements um, all around the city. Um, during COVID, we had more than 250 pedestrian safety improvements go in across the city and it's just exponentially increasing. And then, you know, that's a permanent improvement, but, and we've also been, as we've been repositioning what streets do and how they ought to be used and getting feedback from communities. Um, this is an example of how we are repurposing parts of our streets for, for local use and really creating more uh, public space and open space out of the public way. And this is up at, at Ainsley um, where, you know, we had a little, little dog leg of a street and it wasn't serving a purpose um, other than to probably confuse traffic flow and where we worked with communities in the chamber um, to really reimagine it and to create a uh, open space out of uh, what used to be an underutilized, um, unuseful space. But so much of what we do really has to be embedded what communities tell us they need and want. And again, um, responding to non-traditional ideas. How do we turn a sidewalk into a play space? How do we make sure that we cast a wide net in understanding what people are experiencing when they want to bike or walk in their neighborhoods and translating that to infrastructure investments? So uh, that was plenty. Uh, so maybe I'll stop there. Um, but I just want to thank you all for the opportunity to talk a little bit about what we're doing. Um, I can certainly talk all day, um, but I think we're at a really significant moment in our infrastructure investments, um, not only with the attention that of course it's getting from the federal level, but this repositioning that Chicagoans are seeing this infrastructure as having the potential to be repurposed for these kind of hyper-local needs that have that quality of life impact um, that connects the dots between these larger, more recognizable infrastructure investments um, and what people want to experience in their neighborhoods every day. So thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm happy to, to get into any questions. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, I find it particular, particularly interesting how we are you know, um, I think as an industry, as a nation, just moving to make so much more data driven decisions. And it's great to see how you guys are, you know, using that data to make those decisions um, to, like you said, um, influence those communities that need it the most. Um, I think we can go ahead and kick off our Q&A. And why don't we start with um, an easy question here. Uh, what is your favorite aspect of working at CDOT? Uh, I don't pick favorites. Um, you know, there, there's so many, um, so many cool things, uh, you know, I, so I couldn't just give just one. I think um, there are all of these sort of hidden treasure activities that happen at CDOT every day that I, I get to see because I work here um, and that you, I would love to, to be able to share with things like our machine shop, where for our hundred year old bridges, we make, we machine so many of those parts because they don't make them anymore. Or you have to like, you know, swim over to Germany and haul it back. Um, but we have folks who create those cogs who, you know, true up these internal mechanisms that make it possible for our bridges to be raised and lowered. Um, so like, that's like one favorite aspect. I think another is that just, um, being able to respond to uh, great ideas quickly when you can, that when we can do that, um, I think that's that's really those are exciting moments. You know, we just um, launched the Open Boulevards uh, program, which is part of our Open Streets, um, and that was something that maybe years ago folks remember um, Sunday Parkways, 
which was closing boulevards uh, like the Ciclovias uh, that you might see um, in, in other countries. Um, and so those were, I, those were really hard to put together years ago and took a lot of money and, and uh, it, it was tough. Uh, we just went the simple route and on Sunday we opened up massive tracks of Logan Boulevard to pedestrians only, no cars, a lot of scooters, little, little kids on scooters, uh, expanded the farmer's market. So folks who couldn't ordinarily participate in the farmer's market, there were more, there was more room. Um, and it was a simple idea, right? Let's just make more space. And we were able to pull it off. We've got two more locations coming. Um, and so to see how people walk down the middle of a street safely and go, oh, I never even imagined that I could just, I don't know, pull my kids in a wagon down the middle of Logan Boulevard. That, though, that's an awesome kind of favorite moment, um, but I could go on. Uh, so I think there are a lot of really cool things that happen um, with the team here at CDOT um, that you know, every day I see people um, always going the extra mile, working, working so hard to make the city function. Um, and then those special moments where the public um, can really uh, be captured in, in the imagination of what we can do together. Yeah, and especially, you know, during COVID, um, this pandemic, it's been great to see how we can repurpose those streets and see how we can make better use, um, you know, if there's a better way than just cars using the street in the traditional sense. Um, so I, I love everything that's been done so far. Um, it looks like we have a question from Aaron Alleman. Aaron, do you want to read that or do you want me to? Oh, sure, I'm happy to first uh, and foremost, thank you, Commissioner, for all you're doing. I know that just as I drive around the city, I'm seeing ADA improvements, I'm seeing the bike lane improvements, so it's recognizable and completely commendable to you and your team. My question is, as you were talking about, you know, your good staff going to consulting firms um, and, and thinking about sort of that it takes everybody to, to advance your goals of equity, inclusion and justice, you know, what can the transportation industry be doing proactively? You know, we recognize that you're going to ask your consultants, you know, how does this help advance my goals? But are there things that, that they could be doing, industry could be doing to better support you proactively? Absolutely. Thank you, Aaron, for that question. And uh, I hope everybody knows CMAP and knows Aaron because they're an incredible partner. Um, and, and thank you for all, all the support that you and your organization give. Um, there are plenty of things that we can all do individually. I mean, if, if you, you know, for example, uh, one of the things that we care a lot about is getting people into jobs and getting people who who uh, working on those jobs who live in the neighborhoods where the work is taking place. That is fundamentally something that we uh, care about. And we try to require um, in terms of our contracting, but you know, we have we set up percentages for local hiring, for example, for community hiring. Um, but it'd be great if the private sector was like, you know what, we don't need the, the city to tell us we need to do this. There are plenty of resources, plenty of proactive things. And there are good companies I know on this call um, who put a lot of effort into it, but diversifying your workforce and also creating pathways to leadership um, for folks, uh, for, for particularly black and brown um, uh, residents in Chicago is absolutely critical. Uh, and that's something that we're trying to do, but it's something that companies can, can make great efforts toward. Um, so that's, that's really important. Um, I think looking at some of the, the goals that we have around engagement, I think um, creating in your own, whether it's the, the, how you're maybe reaching out to communities, um, really helping to connect the, the network. We're all talking to uh, such a range of people all the time. How do we connect back to, uh, in a way that, so communities aren't feeling like, oh, we're talking to CMAP over here and we're talking to this consultant for uh, my friends at the county who I see are on the line over here and we're talking to CDOT. Um, ways that we can, I think, share what we're doing so it's not so confusing to communities and making it easy for people to sit at the table. Um, I think those are uh, really important things we could all think about. Like we, um, for our transportation equity network work, we paid uh, those groups to be part of our process. That kind of reciprocity goes a long way to getting people, especially folks who are often marginalized from conversations or don't have time, you know, to come to a community meeting or whatever, uh, but making it, it, it really paying people for their intellectual capital and incentivizing folks to come um, is a big part of making, getting voices to the table that influence all of our projects, right? I think we're constantly asking ourselves like, you know, where um, in the decision-making process, where are we and, and where are the neighborhoods that 
um, are affected by the work that we're doing. And, and I think if everyone gives a hard thought to, you know, when can we hand over decisions to folks who um, have often the least voice in things are really important questions. Doesn't mean every time, but if we're all thinking about that, then it's not just the client saying, I really need you to make sure we have you know, um, you know, the right folks at the table and then ask who's not at the table and then say, who can make a decision at this table and let's expand that. Um, it's helpful if everyone begins to think that way because you know, the more marginalized voices we have, um, that usually covers the folks who have the megaphones already, right? Um, and so I think asking ourselves, um, how is it that we get the voice to the table really matters. This is a long conversation. I keep uh, obviously going on about it. Um, you know, I think I think they're also um, as you know, maybe you page through our strategic plan. If you see something, you're like, oh my gosh, we really know about this topic. And for example, see that's really trying to make some headway, um, making sure that we have good knowledge that we, you know, you guys are working in cities all over the world, uh, many of you, um, making sure that Chicago is not missing out on um, things that we ought to be doing or ways to get communities engaged. So. Um, I don't know, there's a lot we could talk about this and that was a lot of word salad, but uh, I appreciate the question and I think it's an ongoing conversation. Thanks, um, I think we have time for, we have two more questions that have came in, come in from the audience. So um, I think hopefully we can hit both of them. Um, but Jackie Lowe asked, thrilled with the Alfresco on Argyle investment in Uptown that CDOT partnered on with Choose Chicago. How do we get through the colder months to keep building on that momentum? Uh, put on a sweater. Uh, <laughs> it's sweater weather. Um, no, Jackie, great to hear from you. Um, yeah, so the, the Alfresco program has been great. It was a collaboration um, with Choose Chicago, and they had a, a donor um, that was able to create money for better permanent, better looking improvements. Uh, those are not all our barriers out there, by the way. Uh, that's a misconception. You know, we set up the conditions for restaurants to put those up and what the specs were, uh, but they're not always beautiful um, or inviting to communities to do other things, right, to be public spaces. So, um, and I should say we are looking at um, how we could make a better version of our outdoor dining program more permanent. We are looking at, because uh, we were operating kind of on our, uh, a set of pilot um, authorities. Um, but so I think through the colder months, is, is, it, it's so interesting, you know, having spent time, uh, let's say in Scandinavia, as I have, where, you know, you leave your baby in a stroller outside on the sidewalk while you go in and have some hot chocolate. I mean, that's not the culture we're living in, uh, maybe yet. Um, but I think there are places that are um, very attuned to sitting outside in the cold. And we've, we saw a few things like that in fits and starts. Um, we definitely are challenged with snow cleanup and clearance, right? Um, but, you know, even if things quiet in the winter months, um, we, we plan to keep going with this program. And so I think hopefully over time, you know, we'll begin to figure out together um, what, whether through the colder months, what that looks like. Um, we definitely have challenges with having, we don't want too many permanent structures in the public way. And I think um, I have my own criticisms of, of how, you know, I think we can do the program a little bit better. I think it's challenging for people with disabilities. Um, the public way is the public way. Um, and so I think, especially as restaurants can have indoor capacity now, um, we have a lot of uh, hard conversations about uh, making sure that the public way still belongs to the public. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, we have a question in from Brian Castro. He said, thank you very for this very informative presentation. I do have one question. How are the neighborhood plans developed with CMAP assistance incorporated into the long-term needs of CDOT? Well, I think there's a ton of alignment between CMAP and the neighborhood planning and uh, what we've just laid out in terms of our strategic plan. And that is one of the reasons why we want it to be very transparent. Um, like that we, we do see that values that, you know, and, and Aaron, you can speak for CMAP, uh, but in terms of the goals of those planning efforts, I think it aligns very well. Um, but we have to stay in great communication. And I think that's, I think that's what I was trying to get at with, we're often talking to the same neighborhoods or the same groups on different topics. And so one of the things that we need, you know, that I know at CDOT we want to do better is communicating well, both with communities and the other entities that are doing work there so we can be in better alignment. Um, but yeah, we, we take it all in and we want to make sure that um, the hard work of other entities 
um, is incorporated to our own. And I, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a special time, I think, right now in our city where um, the emphasis on, on transportation infrastructure investments, and we are lucky to have so many organizations doing good work. Um, I think as, as long as we continue to share information and find those points of convergence in what we're all doing, um, we'll, we'll get it right. Okay, and then why don't why don't we wrap up with one one easier one, um, unless anyone else has a question. <laughs> I haven't seen anything come in, um, but what is one of the best pieces of career advice you've been given? Uh, be curious about uh, fields that you might not think you are a perfect fit for, but you have energy for it and run after it. Um, you know, I, my career, I was in parks, right? Uh, which was really thinking about what public space we own in common has to do with moving our city forward in an equitable um, way. And then when people go, oh, then you went to Studio Gang and, you know, in, in a high design firm. Um, but, you know, the proposition of what are the tools for design and how do you put those in service of making better public spaces, right? Those start to connect. Um, it feels like a leap, but it, um, you know, it was, it was certainly an interest of mine. And then transportation, right? It's, I see it as a natural <laughs> extension of those sets of experiences. It looks, can look very disparate. Um, but if you sort of follow those through lines of thinking about, you know, what are the areas of interest that you have and being open to learning new skills um, to hopefully be effective there, uh, it'll lead you down some, some fun paths. I don't know, more champagne on Fridays. I don't know. <laughs> More fun, no. have fun, go after fun things. And that's great advice. And I think so I many know. people do get scared and you know they get comfortable in their little bubbles and being the expert, but a little bit of curiosity, you never know what you might find. So that's great advice. And I think it gives um, inspiration to people who might be wanting to take that first step and just a little bit scared or nervous to do it. So um, thank you so much, Commissioner, sure. for your presentation. I think this group, um, learn so much. I know we've had a strong request from our membership to hear from you. So we're so glad to have this opportunity to do so. Um, and thank you also for being a partner of WTS uh, with CDOT. So um, we hope to see you soon um, in person, hopefully one day. <laughs> but um, again, thank you very much for this presentation. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, appreciate, and I appreciate uh, everybody pretty much on this call has probably something to do with what we do. Um, and so it, it takes a village to get the work done. And I appreciate what everyone's doing toward that end. So have and a great that, day. <laughs> well, thank you. We'll wrap up. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Bye.